I had worked for the Sinatra uh, family. I worked for the, the company. I wrote for Frank Jr., for Frank Sr., and I knew Frank Sr. And there was a manager there, okay? His name was Tino Barzi. And I was very friendly with Barzi because he was Frank's road manager, okay? At one point, a very wealthy Israeli by the name of Meshulam Rickless. Rickless wanted married Pia Zadora. And she was a singer on Broadway at the time. So he went to Tino Bozzi and he asked him to leave Sinatra and become the manager of, um, of Pia Zadora. So he did. Meantime, when Pia Zadora first came on the scene, he, uh, uh, Barzi had just joined. He called me and he said, what are you doing? I said, I'm on my way for a year. I'll be in, in Europe with uh, Rex Harrison and Rod Taylor and Mario Puzo and I Thank are you, going. Though. And he said, we're doing a time to die. He said, do you have a little role in there for Pia? He said, because I just went with them, can you get something for Pia? I said, Tino, there's really nothing in there for Pia. Except. So he said, at least get her to read for you. Okay, so I auditioned her. Okay, she came in and she read for the Lynn Stocker role, the one that I used, uh, uh, the Norwegian actress in uh, Time to Die. Mm. I let her read that role. I said, thank you, thank you, it's good reading, but you're too American. So I went off, and for seven, eight months, I was in Europe doing that film. When I came back, I get a phone call, okay, from Tito. He says, Matt, Rickless wants a movie for Pia. He said, can you come up with any ideas? And I had seen Pia. He said, come and see her nightclub act. She was playing in a nightclub. And I went and she was cute and she was bouncy and a lot of energy. And then I remembered that Jack Warner and Warner Brothers years ago bought a James Kane novel called Butterfly and the, the uh, commission, uh, what do you call the commission back then, told him, no, you yeah. can't make the film. The Brian office? Uh, yeah. yeah. They said, no. And so what happened? Warner took the book and put it up here. Now, James King was a hot writer. I mean, he had won two yes. Academy, his novels won, uh, Postman Always Rings Twice. Yeah. So what happened? I started thinking about that novel. I had read that novel. I had read all of James Kane's stuff. So I went over to Paramount. I had a friend of mine at Paramount was doing a film. I worked a lot writing scripts over there and getting cash, you know. And this one producer says, I own the rights to Butterfly. I said, you're kidding. I said, how did you get it? He says, oh, I went there through all that, uh, uh, stuff when, when Jack Warner died, and I, I optioned and bought it. I said, how much were you selling for? He said, I sell it, eh, he says, 25000 So that night, I go to dinner. The next night, I go to dinner with Rickless, and I meet Rickless. I met him once very briefly. He didn't like me, okay? Because I turned Pierre down for the other movie, right? He was that kind of guy. So I go to this dinner, in this very nice restaurant. And I said, well, I think I have something. It's called Butterfly. It's a very sexy role. It's set in West Virginia, in coal mines. I said, but it's a very good role. He said, yeah. He said, okay. He said, can you get the, can you buy it? I said, yeah, if I go. I said, give me, a, the guy wants 25000 He said, come to my office tomorrow, you'll have a check for 25000 Like that, okay? Then he said, who's going to direct it? He tells me, who's going to direct it? I said, well, I said, 
I don't know, you can get any director. He said, he said, would you direct it? I said, yeah, I could direct it. He said, why should I use you? I have so much money, I could buy the guy who won the Academy last Award last year for scripts. I could buy the Academy Award director who won the director. What do I need you for? I said, okay, good night. I said, he, uh, I said I'll said i get you the rights because Tino Bozzi is my friend. I said, you pay me 5000 for my effort. He, okay. said, come, he said, come to the office tomorrow. Come to the office the next day. Meanwhile, he owned the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas. He said, you come this weekend up to the Riviera. I came up, I'm gonna cut real quick. The Shulam Rickers and I became the best friends of all time. The closest, we lived together for 12 years, okay? His wife hated me because his husband, her husband loved me. Yes, I'd known Orson since my days in New York. What had happened was there was a period of time when the 41st Street Theater in New York was empty, most Broadway theaters are empty on Monday nights. So a friend of mine, who I knew a long time, owned the theater, and I had a great idea. I was gonna do the Poets Theater every Monday night. I would have stars from Broadway come on Monday night and read poetry. Orson was at City Center and he was doing King Lear and he had broken his leg and he was doing King Lear in a wheelchair, if you could believe it. And so I went backstage one night and I said, would you come and read some poetry for us on a Monday night? I know that Orson loved poetry, okay? Especially the sonnets and Keats, you know, he loved. So he said, okay. He said, I'll come. He said, but you can't tell me what I can read. I read what I want and for as long as I want. No hooks, meaning I can't get them off the stage because somebody else is waiting. And I had to, I was charging $3 a head and keeping all the money. I paid the stage hand and I was making, I was a kid making money doing the Poets Theater, you know, and people would just come get up on stage and read poetry to people. Before you know it, the place was always crowded at three bucks a head. It was pretty good. So that's how long I know Orson, yeah. Uh, no, what happened was very simple. One night, okay, we were shooting a late night scene in the courtroom, and I told the crew, I said, you know, Orson used to like to imbibe pretty good, and we couldn't start until nine o'clock at night. I said, guys, what we should do is shoot the judge with two cameras, shoot him with the, with the other two off camera, and get everything on Orson that we need. I said, then we'll turn, when it's later, we'll turn the cameras around and we'll get Pia and Stacy. Well, it worked out well. Orson got through his whole role, did a wonderful job, okay. Finally, I said, okay, let's turn the cameras around. And I put Pia up there and Stacy. I'm about two minutes into rehearsing and setting it up. All of a sudden, I get a hit, hit in the back of my, my back, it's Orson. He said, I have to talk to you. I have to talk to you right away. So we go off, he goes to his dressing room, I go to his dressing room, I said, what is it, Orson? He said, you ruined me, you ruined me. He said, you made me play it big and boisterous, and he said, you're, you're directing them soft and tone-wise. He said, I'm gonna look silly, I'm gonna look this. I said, Orson, relax. I said, first of all, I said, Pia is the violin. Stacy is the piano. I said, and you're the oboe. <laughs> he screamed, 
I've never been an oboe in my life. I said, Orson, you're the biggest ham actor that Hollywood has ever had. I said, that's part of your charm and that's why people love you.